Welcome to Is It Philosophy, a member of the Michigan Sports and Entertainment Podcast Network. Here, we are the seekers of truth. We are the askers of the questions. The answerers of those questions, probably. Each episode, myself and a guest or two, start with a question, then we set out on a journey to find an answer. In the end, it's up to you to determine, is it philosophy? All right, everybody, we're back for another episode. Today, I'm joined with by Will Marlowe from the podcast Mecha Dragon. Is that correct, Will? That is correct. We've got a very interesting topic today that I absolutely love. We're going to talk about how would you survive a zombie apocalypse? So, Will, what are your thoughts on that? How would we go about that? Well, I personally think the key to surviving the zombie apocalypse is preparation, even though it's you know, it seems like it'd be kind of hard to see that sort of thing coming. <laughs> I don't know. Do you, do you, I wonder if how hard it would be to see, because I just read an article not too long ago that they, uh, what was it? I think it was Oxford or some university just found a way to revive a dead pig brain. Obviously, they didn't bring it back to full life, but it gained some function that they could measure on the, the brain. They did it to like 32 pig brains. Wow. Yeah, there's no way that can go wrong. Huh? Yeah, right? <laughs> That was actually why this, this topic to me was so fascinating because I just read that a couple of days ago. And my thought has always been the zombie apocalypse is going to be brought about by either a, a solution or a cure to Alzheimer's or whatever they're doing with these pig brains. I don't remember what it was, but so I think we will be able to have preparation for it. I think it's, it's coming, right? I think it's going to be something we bring upon ourselves. So what preparation do you think we could go about? Is there, for me, I've got a, uh, it's kind of nerdy and I'm totally on board with that, but I've got a zombie ready machete in my Ooh. closet right now. Green nice. handle, the whole thing. So and I've heard it said, and I think there was a Mythbusters episode where they used different weapons, swords, axes. I can't remember all of it. What do you think weaponry is, is the key to that? And what weaponry would we go about using? Well, you know, that's a good point. And, uh, you know, just related to what you said a, a moment uh, before, I do always refer to the zombie apocalypse as the inevitable zombie apocalypse. But in terms of weapons, I mean, you're, you're ahead of me at this point because uh, you got the machete, but I got my Excalibur letter opener. Uh, I think that's about <laughs> as much as I have in terms of weaponry. But um, I, I do think, you know, weapons will be important if you got to hack your way through some from zombies or walkers or whatever you want to whatever you want to call them. I'm, I'm thinking machete is probably good. Hopefully, I think ideally you want a weapon that's not going to cause too much of the infected blood to splash onto like your face and into your nose and, you know, other orifices. Uh, so, you know, maybe uh, maybe like a bat, like a like a blunt instrument might be nice to have or a slicing instrument or Maybe uh, slicing seems like it might uh, be prone to blood sprays. Probably. So you're thinking more of, to, to reference a show that most people are probably pop familiar with, a, a Negan-style barbed wire rat bat is, is something that probably would be your best bet. That, that could work, yeah. I, I, think, I think maybe Negan had the right idea with that weapon. I know it was very personal to him. But <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> personal connections notwithstanding, I, you know, I... Pr- a gun actually is probably the ideal thing, assuming you know how to fire one and you have access to one and you have plenty of ammo. But uh, yeah, that's that's going to be my final answer, I think, on the weapon. See, I always didn't. I always see a gun as sort of a, a hindrance. It's great for the first two, three, four months. Eventually, you're going to run out of bullets, or it's going to jam, or it's going to get dirty, or or something is going to happen, and then you basically just have a really fancy club. Yeah, that's a good point. And actually, I think the other danger with a gun is that it's really loud. And if we're assuming that zombies uh, are attracted by sound, um, you could just be, well, shooting yourself in the foot, pun intended, uh, by, you know, by firing one off because you may get rid of that one in front of you. But now you have like a thousand of them coming at you from all sides. That's another interesting topic. Let's let's hit that for a moment. What are we assuming these zombies are? Are they walking dead, slow, stupid? Are they uh, 28 days later where they're, they're quicker? Are they World War Z where they're really quick? <laughs> how are these zombies? How, and are they maybe, I know Game of Thrones isn't known for zombies, but are they Game of Thrones style zombie where they're actually intelligent and cognitive? 
Now, I think the ones in Game of Thrones, there's a, cu- a couple levels of intelligence. You have the whites, which are like the foot soldiers and the ones that are like all rotting away. And those ones seem pretty mindless, but, you know, subject to the commands of their masters, which are the like the uh, the ones that almost look like they have ice for skin, you know, like the Night King mm-hmm. and his lieutenants. So and those ones seem to have some intelligence. But I all have always adhered to the notion that zombies proper, you know, in the in the uh, in the classic uh, Romero tradition are slow moving, not actually real smart. Uh, although there was a Romero movie where they started to sort of regain their their senses. I oh, I can't remember the title of that one. I remember John Leguizamo was in it. But in any case, I, I've always adhered to the notion that they're kind of slow because I just can't, it just doesn't make sense to me that they're like super fast, like faster, you know, and quicker than a regular person because they're I, I don't necessarily disagree with that. I do remember, I can't think of the name of the movie. I think it was World War Z where they start off fresh dead. They're really, really quick. They're, they have some speed and semi intelligence. They're not cognitive intelligence, but they're they're able to reason minor things. And then as time progressed, they got slower and dumber. So to me, that mm-hmm. kind of seems like the ideal approach. Because fresh dead, you're you're gonna still have all the the juices, so to speak, flowing through you. <laughs> the juices. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I'm I mean, not, a, mm-hmm. for lack of no, a that makes term. some sense. Yeah, that makes some sense to me because if you're fresh dead, the you know the rigor mortis hasn't set in, or I guess if you're a zombie, rigor mortis doesn't really set in. But uh, yeah, I guess the fresher you are, the quicker you could be. That makes some sense to now, me. Now, I want to explore who would you be? Would you be the, the hero? Would you be the <laughs> Eugene type, the guy that, that does what it takes to, to survive? Or would you just be the, the lackey that kind of survives based on who you surround yourself with? I see. Well, uh, you know, I think it goes without saying that in the inevitable zombie apocalypse, you're going to want to be surrounded by uh, other people whom you can trust. But uh, I think the answer for me comes down to two possibilities. I'm either the guy that uh, goes down in a blaze of glory, like protecting his family, because I have a, a wife and a son with another one on the way. And so I feel like I would do whatever it takes to keep them safe and possibly might go down. Uh, doing that or I'm you know I could also be the the character that sort of gathers other people you know and we we head off together and you know I'm sort of there leading them and convincing everybody to take you know more and more drastic action to to stay alive you know a Rick Grimes if you sure see I I think I'm one of two as well I think I'm either zombie because I'm fat and slow or (laughs) I'm I'm a Eugene I'm the guy that's going to use my ability to talk and convince everybody that I've got the cure and you've got to keep me safe because I am not a fighter. I pretend I am. I want to think I'm the, the Negan Rick Grimes type that's going to get her everybody's together and, and be the guy that, that leads everybody to safety. But I'm, I'm not. I know who I am. I'm okay with that. <laughs> You're the brains, not the brawn. Exactly. I don't even know if I'm yeah. necessarily the brains. I'm just, I'm really good at talking. I, I have yeah. a, a way with words usually, not always. Today's one of those days I don't, but usually I do. Yeah, when I have those days, I just I need to drink more coffee. Yeah, coffee is a good thing. That you know, uh, side note, that might be one of the biggest downsides of the inevitable zombie apocalypse is running out of coffee. I don't necessarily agree with. I don't disagree with that. I, I think the the lack of coffee, and I think that would be what would probably kill me is is not being able to wake up in the morning and have that cup of coffee around that campfire. I think that's where I would probably die. Okay. Okay. Either that or so. So because you wouldn't have your coffee you would die and then rise again to kill all of your friends basically is what you're Probably. saying. Yeah. Okay. I, I, well, I think the, the zombie I am in the morning before my cup of coffee will just inevitably carry over into that. <laughs> well, the end times are full of tragedy. To be sure. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, no doubt that. And, and I think the, the lack of pizza, I don't know that I would survive on, on without it. That's tough, but you know, thankfully, pizza isn't all that complicated to make. If you could, if you could make some bread and get some other ingredients together, grow a couple tomatoes, you know, I think pizza could still be in our future at post-apocalypse. Hopefully, you know? I'm I'm down for that. Which actually brings up another interesting topic: food. How do you gather food, and where do you find the food after? I mean, obviously, you're going to raid pantries and and stores, but after that supply is run out, where do you get your food yeah. supply? 
Yeah, you can only loot for so long. I mean, so so this is actually a kind of um, this is something that I've thought about quite a lot because you know we actually so I live in Los Angeles. So we actually have like a backup supply of food and water that we keep in a secure location, you know, just in case there's a, a like a bad earthquake or, you know, like a, like a fire, or, you know, some type of disaster, like a zombie apocalypse, for example. <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, eventually that is going to run out. And uh, even if it's the end times, you can only loot for so long. But I think that the really what this question depends on, uh, in my mind, is where you are. Because if you're in the city like me, you got to get out of the city. A, you're not going to be able to, there's not a whole lot of farmable land that you're going to find in an urban area, especially somewhere like Los Angeles, which is basically a desert. And once you don't have that whole infrastructure transporting water here, you know, uh, to consume, then you're, you're, you're out of luck. You gotta, you gotta go elsewhere. But if you're in like a suburban or a more rural area in any sort of temperate climate, you can have a garden, you know, you can, you can grow stuff. You can go forage in the, in the woods, you know, you can, um, you know, you can grow your own food and eventually become self-sufficient. Uh, it's not to say that that's, that's going to be easy if you're not already a farmer, know what you're doing, but it, it can be done. And I think it'll, you know, that eventually becomes a necessity. And for those two reasons, that's why part of my zombie apocalypse plan is to get the heck out of the city. So that's an interesting idea because I, th- I think we kind of, as a society, have lost. Most of us have lost that ability to to hunt and gather and and farm. We are more. If I can't buy it from the grocery store, it doesn't exist. And when those grocery stores no longer exist, I think we're all screwed. Yeah, we're totally disconnected from how food is uh, gathered and, and prepared, and you know, shoved in these little styrofoam plastic containers for us. I remember somebody told me a story. Uh, and they swore up and down that this was true, that uh, some, some, uh, some group, I don't think it was an animal rights group, but it was, they were just kind of raising awareness about the, the food supply and how disconnected we are from it is they, you know, when you go into the grocery store and they all have those like little like samples for you, like, oh, here's like some coffee or here's some crackers or like, you know, here's some bacon or whatever. Yeah. Well, they had, they had this like delicious, like uh, pork belly or bacon. And that they were handing out, people were like, "Oh, it's so good!" You know, they're they're just clumping over by this little stand to eat it all. And then he runs out, and he's like, "Oh, well, I ran out. Uh, if you guys want to hold on for a couple of minutes, I can I can prepare some more for you guys." And everybody's like, "Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll just wait here." And so he pulls out a baby pig, a, a real live one, and then like he pulls out a big meat cleaver, and suddenly everybody's like, "No, stop! Don't don't do it!" But that's exactly how it's made, right? Yeah. You don't get bacon without killing a little pig or a big pig. We get meat from animals that have to be slaughtered. And that's not something that's really at the forefront of our minds when we're eating a hamburger necessarily. Yeah. We don't want to think we're, we're eating Bessie. That definitely kind of taints the, the flavor of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, although I have a feeling that after the inevitable zombie apocalypse, I might not have the stomach to do more than vegetarian, you know, depending on what's available. I mean, after you see your friend's face eaten off by a zombie, it's kind of ruins the, the whole hamburger thing. Yeah, probably. I, I could see the the lack of desire for that, that hamburger after watching a friend turn into hamburger. <laughs> I could just imagine like sitting around the campfire the next night, just kind of staring at it and putting it down and be like, no, I, I can't do this. Yeah. I don't, I don't, don't, I don't doubt that. Pass the beats or whatever, whatever you got. Yeah. As for, as for other preparation though, cause I did mention at the beginning that I think preparation is key. Um, so we actually have uh, paper maps. Does anybody remember those? <laughs> I don't think I've seen one of those in years. Yeah, I mean, just in case we have to navigate out without the aid of our handy-dandy GPS devices, you know, we got some paper maps. I actually uh, was a Boy Scout, um, so with a compass, I can. Uh, I, I had my orienteering merit badge, so, uh, you know, I can head in the same direction over long distances <laughs> when, when that's required. Uh, I know how to camp and, and that sort of thing. We have all types of emergency supplies. One of the great things uh, when I met my wife was, well, after we got together and we were, you know, dating and to the point where we could like buy birthday presents for each other and stuff, I would look on her like Amazon wish list and she would have stuff on there like gas mask, Kevlar vest, you know, uh, solar panels, things like that. She's, she's a big, pre- I wouldn't say she's like a really hardcore doomsday prepper or anything, but she certainly has uh, a lot of that stuff. And, and now together with our powers 
and paranoia combined, uh, we have all kinds of uh, supplies that we would need in an emergency situation. See, if I saw that on my wife's wish list, I wouldn't think doomsday prep. I would think, oh my God, what is she planning for me? How do I get out of it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you have to, you have to walk that fine line between, uh, you know, prepping for disaster and uh, arming your enemies against you. <laughs> yeah. I, I could, I love her to death, but I, if that was on her wish list, I would be, I'd be worried a lot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know that's that's preparation for you. It's it's funny you mention navigation and and whatnot. I don't think many people. I know I don't, but I don't think most people know how to actually use or read a compass. I know it's the whole magnetic north thing and it points north, but I could see me just walking in a circle, having no idea what to do, or, or looking at my watch and walking around in a circle for twelve hours, thinking I'm following my compass. Oh right. Well, it's not it's not a hundred percent intuitive to just look at a compass and know how to get your way from, from A to B to C. You know, after all, I did have to earn a merit badge to learn that. I remember Boy Scouts. I was one for a very short period of time before I, uh, we'll say I got kicked out for doing things that were not part of the Boy Scout program. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a, I wasn't a good Boy Scout, so I didn't get all the, the merit badges and whatnot. You know, to each his own. I say I, I admire people who are able to do it. I've I've got friends who are Eagle Scouts and stuff, and I think it's amazing, just for the sheer fact that they know how to do things. I have no clue how to do, and they're the ones I'm going to run to in the inevitable zombie right. apocalypse. I'm a dude, right? right? You know what you're doing. Well, the, like this this leads into another thing that I thought we would get into is you also need to surround your people uh, yourself with people who have skills, right? So obviously, you want people who are tough and who know how to handle themselves. But, you know, assuming that you're going to survive and surround yourself with a small community that's able to grow in the future so that there can be a future in the post-zombie apocalypse, you know, hopefully you can get civilization going again with maybe somebody knows how to build houses. Somebody is an electrician. You know, somebody is uh, this, somebody is that. Somebody knows how to slaughter a deer, you know, so that you can... uh, so that you can do all that. So I, I think that's going to be important uh, as well. Speaking for myself, I can uh, make a fire with uh, with nothing but like a, some sticks and a shoestring. I can do it with a match. <laughs> with a match. And a lighter. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that works. <laughs> <laughs> no, and that's actually an interesting concept because you never really think about the afterwards. I think, at least I never do. You know, you think about that initial survival, but then what happens after survival? I think that's what I th- everybody was drawn to The Walking Dead for is because it's that... Mm. Okay, we've survived. Now we have to rebuild and we have to rebuild knowing that this threat is always there. How do you rebuild around that threat and get society and culture back to maybe not what it was, but what it could be? I think that's an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And uh, these are thoughts that I have late at night after I've watched the latest episode of The Walking Dead or something like that. Uh, And and you kind of wonder, it's like, in my in my own mind, I think, okay, well, my my friend, you know, Dave could could be like have this role in the new society. <laughs> you know, my friend Joe would be great for like this, and Bob would be over here, like in charge of that. And obviously, in my mind, I'm the leader of this new community. Oh yeah, of course. I, <laughs> I don't know if that would actually work out that way. I guess it would if I'm the option where I'm the Rick Grimes type person. If I'm the guy that dies five minutes into the zombie apocalypse, it's not really going to be a concern. But I have to keep that hope alive for what comes after, you know, the direst moments of bear survival. I think it would definitely, there was a, like somewhere in Georgia, there's a, Georgia Stonehenge is what they call it. And it's a stone tablet type thing that, that somebody put up and it's got like 12 or 13 rules for survival. And one of them on there that I remember the most is that, for the, the world to survive, there needs to be no more than 500,000 people. And that, to me, that's a very interesting idea because if oh. we ever get that zombie apocalypse, we may get to that point of homeostasis. And I think that may even be a thing that Mother Nature naturally puts in, in place for us is that natural homeostasis again. That's that's real interesting. And yes, I have also heard you know this, this uh, I, I don't know if you'd call it a theory per se, but this idea that it, when the inevitable zombie apocalypse occurs, this is, you know, Mother Nature's way of sort of balancing us out and keeping us in check. And that's kind of interesting. Uh, oh, I can't remember the other point that you brought up in that in that statement. The 500,000 people? The 500,000. So, I, you know, I'm a big nerd. And uh, I, 
at one point was doing all this research into like a generational starships colonizing other planets. But the, the functional question there was, how many people does it take to have a viable enough gene pool so that you have enough people to perpetuate the species? And you brought up that 500,000 uh, number. And I remember reading that with 2,000 people, you can have a viable population for, I don't know, it was a matter of centuries, I think. But after that, you're going to run into like lots of genetic bottlenecks and other problems really quickly. Now, I'm no geneticist or expert, so take that for, you know, this for what it's worth. Uh, <laughs> but what I read was the ideal number in terms of making absolutely sure that you have enough genetic diversity uh, for the species to survive in a healthy way is uh, 2 million. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Which, which is not a small number when you're talking about, you know, taking a spaceship to another planet. But, you know, potentially out of how many, like, what, 7 billion people on the planet now, 2 million seems like a pretty small percentage of who would be left. That would be, yeah, I think that many die of diseases daily. So, I mean, it's, it's a crazy number to think of that many being actually alive. It's scary. Well, you also have to assume that they're in the same place or roughly the same place where they can sort of intermingle, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's a, it's a sobering thought to think that we could be taken back to that that level. My goodness. Well, and that's true. That would take us back to a, a Stone Age type idea, right? Where we got no power, no no nothing. You are basically just candle lights and, and what you can scrounge. Well, that's the thing is like, how much knowledge are we going to lose in the inevitable zombie apocalypse? I mean, how many engineers are we going to have left? How many doctors? How many surgeons? How many physicists? How many electricians? How many... You name it, people that know how to use, not just use technology, but to maintain it and to, and to make new pieces of technology that we're going to need, right? Would technology really be that dire, though, in that instance? I, th I think it becomes a matter of what you can make and what you can forage. And then beyond that, I don't know how valuable technology would be. I mean, obviously, we're not talking iPhones, right? But we're talking yeah. <laughs> building a power grid again, right? Somebody's got to maintain that if we ever have a hope of getting it back again. That's true. I mean, I think that's a really good question because obviously, I'm not going to be looking to get the next iPhone uh, in the post-apocalypse. Uh, that's not going to be important in any way. But I think that there's still value in having basic electrical services, you know, and being able to have access to uh, machinery like something as simple as a car or a bulldozer because if we get to this point and we don't even have access to like rudimentary construction equipment we're back to you know building mud houses or you know huts or uh, you know constructing the simplest possible you know dwellings for us to live in without the benefit of like this machinery that could allow us to do it in like a fraction of the time so I think that even though technically we're not going to need any of this high technology to survive, you know, assuming we can find a way to feed ourselves and have shelter, I think that it still could make a, a big difference in how we're able to continue living and how successfully we can get civilization moving again in the long term. And that's not even to speak of medical technology. Just, I mean, and medical technology to, to me also includes just medical knowledge of what to do, how to treat certain, you know, certain things that, uh, that come up. Yeah, but is it really that bad to go back to a simpler time? I think I think that's what's so intriguing to me about this whole idea is society in general is just so wrapped up in in the next great latest greatest technology, the the next best thing, the working yourself to death because you need a whatever, the next great thing. Is is it really such a bad thing though to go back to a simpler time living in, in the mud hut, having to actually have a legitimate conversation with somebody face to face, God forbid. <laughs> right. I, I don't think that's a terrible thing. Obviously the, the whole zombie apocalypse end of it is, but I don't know that, that going back to simpler, less technology driven is such a horrible idea. I, I, you know, I, I don't disagree. I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with living in a, in a simpler way, so to speak, a less technologically saturated life. At first, obviously, a lot of people won't be used to that, right? But yeah, there, there's nothing, I don't think, I think you're right. I, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that, especially when you consider society as a whole these days probably isn't, hasn't kept up with the latest technology. I mean, we, we have this amazing technology that's advancing at an exponential rate, whereas 
our culture and sort of rules in society that we've made for ourselves haven't 100% caught up with the level of technology that's that's out there, uh, it, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have, I mean, if you watch, just for example, like if you watch uh, like a like a congressional hearing with like the, like the tech giants from Silicon Valley, it's very, very clear that Congress doesn't have a very good grasp on this technology. And I'm not looking to point fingers at anybody and say, you know, you're dumb for not knowing this. What I'm saying is these are the people who make the laws of the land and they don't understand what's going on in these realms. Just, you know, in, in, in some cases. Yeah, I forget. Was it the, the Facebook hearing where one of the congressmen yeah. was talking about how the internet tubes get clogged up? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking of. <laughs> that's the hearing I was thinking of when I mentioned that, yeah. Yeah, and you're just sitting back going, wow, okay. It's and a real facepalm moment, yeah. You're making our rules. We are, we are all screwed. Yeah, so, so in that sense, I, I don't think it would be terrible, but I think really the main thing about losing access to a lot of technology that would be bad are the ways in which technology allows us to live healthier. I think that's, that would probably be, you know, you can't belabor the loss of like being able to watch TV every night. I mean, I love movies and TV as much as the next guy, really. I mean, I'm a super geek, but in the context of post zombie apocalypse, you know, if you're live and you got your, you know, your friends and your family there with you alive and you've found a way to be safe and grow food and have shelter, you probably shouldn't complain too much about not being able to watch the latest episode of Game of Thrones or something. True. So when you're saying healthier, though, are we? How, what are we talking healthier? Because I, I wholeheartedly think that our, our modern day medicine and, and all the stuff that is supposedly making us healthier is, is pretty much doing just the opposite. It's that medicine, in my opinion, that's going to drive us to this zombie apocalypse. Like I said before, the cure for Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or something is, in my opinion, that's what's going to drive us to this apocalypse. That would be the great irony of it, wouldn't it? Where the, you know, the search for ways to make us healthier ends up being our, our destruction. I think that's what's so beautiful, uh, beautiful about it, in my opinion. Yeah, that's that's real interesting. Such a such a great irony. Well, you know, I mean, there's there's certain, you know, you can say at a certain level, like we don't necessarily need uh, like the massive array of pharmaceuticals that are at our beck and call necessarily. But I think that especially as those of us who survived the zombie apocalypse get older, you know, we're we're just not going to live as long because we won't have you know a heart medication or you know, that pill that's going to, you know, treat your Alzheimer's, for example, or treatment for cancer, even just just things like that, that are just part of the standard sort of getting older. And, you know, as you as you just age, I think that you'll we'll just have lower life expectancies. And that that would be a shame. Although, you know, the fact that we survived would still be a a huge mark in our favor. So I'm going to say something and everybody out there, don't hate me for a moment, but I'm going to say something for, to you and I want your opinion on this. So do you think, obviously we would probably die quicker right away, but through natural selection and, and getting rid of the weak and, and the sickly and the unhealthy, that our gene pool would then grow stronger and then maybe not two or three or four generations, but maybe five, six, when, when we've had that greater gathering of the strength of the genes, don't, don't you think that our, our uh, life expectancy would then increase again? See, I don't think so. I mean, if you're talking about natural selection, I, if the, the selection is occurring out of the events of the apocalypse, I think it's too random. It's not, that's not something that's selecting for certain traits necessarily. I think that people that survive in this location versus this location, it could be totally external factors, not necessarily anything that's inborn in their DNA. This, this is just my opinion on how I see it. Mm -hmm. And uh, humans have been around for, you know, many thousands of years and we haven't really changed all that much in like the last 40,000 years to 70,000 years, physically speaking. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think that that would be a huge factor personally, like in the next, you know, six or seven generations, I think is what you, uh, what you said. Yeah. Now I think it would definitely have a huge cultural impact everywhere. See, I don't know. I, I think the reason, again, don't hate me out there, but I again <laughs> think the reason that we haven't changed as a species is because we are allowing the weak and, and the sickly and whatever you want to call it, I'd be dead too. So don't get me wrong. I've got horrible vision. I'm basically <laughs> legally blind. So I'd be dead too. But it's, it's those genes that we're allowing to, to continue to carry on that back in 
the dark ages or, or whatever would have been eradicated. They wouldn't have been able to carry on. And I think the same thing happens as we get deeper and deeper into the zombie apocalypse where those, those weak genes get sort of weeded out regardless because you're not going to survive if you can't see. You're not going to survive if you're fat or you're stupid, right? You're not, that person isn't going to survive. So those genes don't get passed on. I don't know. I don't think there's a stupid gene well, uh, as far as I'm aware. Maybe not. No, no, I know what you're saying though. I know what you're saying. Uh, I, I just think that it's, yeah, I, I don't know. I stand by my previous statement. That's all. Okay. I'm, I'm good with that. So what else? What do you think else happens in, in this apocalypse as we move towards, let's give ourselves a hundred years down the road? Ooh, Where do we years. go? What happens in that moment? Are we still fighting off zombies or have we learned to live with the zombies or are they just all gone? We finally wiped them all out. See, I think, okay, here we go. <laughs> I've put a little thought into this sort of in, you know, those late night moments after like an episode of what, you know, some undead show ends or something in a hundred years. See, it's only going to take maybe a couple years for the initial barrage of zombies to just decompose to the point where they're just bones. So they can't really move anymore. Now that's not to say that every time somebody dies, you're not going to have a new zombie. But I think that after a certain number of years, once people are able to, you know, get more of a, um, a foothold, you know, back in the world, that what's going to happen is our culture will adapt and have rules that allow us to sort of head it off at the pass, so to speak. So say somebody dies, well, you're going to have a ritual where, you know, just to use the example of like, you have to destroy the brain, right? To make sure that zombie doesn't arise or to kill the zombie. You know, maybe once somebody dies, there's like a very intimate ritual where you like slide like a, like a ceremonial dagger or something like into the, you know, the base of the skull to prevent, you know, that person from rising again. And I think that once those sort of practices are adopted, you know, by societies at large, that, you know, you may get like a, an outlier here or there, but you're never going to have like the hordes and hordes of, of zombies coming up again. And it'll just become this, you know, this big part of society and culture uh, with this, you know, legendary, like epic, uh, awful, awful disaster that's happened in the past that, that sort of informs all these current uh, practices, in my opinion. I, th- I think you probably are right on that one. I think as, as time progresses, you sort of get that. I think that's where a lot of the Back in the dark ages, they used to do things to keep people from coming back as vampires because they were alive and or they thought they right. were it's true. And I, I think the funeral pyre definitely becomes another sort of way of, of stopping that. I think we get that oh, technology right. back. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's just fire, basically. Yeah. You know? But once the body's burned, right, it's not going to come back. So. Oh, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, fire, destroy the brain. Th- those are the two main methods that I'm sticking with in my mind as to how you kill a zombie, right? You, you burn it or you, you know, stab it in the, in the head. All right. So to wrap this up, what, in your opinion, is the ideal got to have perfect thing day one of zombie apocalypse? Day one zombie. So is this like my zombie apocalypse survival kit that I'm describing? Things you have to have on you day one of the, the apocalypse. Right. First of all, you need at least 48 hours worth of food and water, uh, preferably, you know, the food being as light as possible. So maybe like dry rations or canned food uh, or something. But you also need, like we were talking about before, a good weapon. I'm going to say you should have a gun with plenty of ammo, although that's probably should not be your go to weapon like at first. Right. That, that would only be used in certain situations where you're not going to bring down like, you know, the surrounding five miles of like all the zombies down on you. Yeah. But I would say like a machete or a sword or a bat, it would probably be my weapon of choice. You're going to want some type of protective gear so that if, you know, one gets through and like decides to chomp on your wrist, that it's not going to bite into your flesh immediately, whether that's you know, a jacket where you've wrapped a bunch of duct tape around it or, you know, some type of tactical gear, <laughs> whatever you can get to make sure that you have at least some type of protection uh, going out into the, uh, into the wild, uh, so to speak. So I think that those are like the bare necessities. You want to have, I think, some communications equipment. Here uh, in my family, we have a pair of uh, long-distance walkie-talkies that actually, if you apply to the, uh, the FCC, you can even get a permit to use frequencies that will carry over like 20 miles. Wow. Yeah, I, I did not apply for that permit, but you can do that. I figure in the zombie apocalypse, nobody's going to care. 
Um, <laughs> point. <laughs> uh, so communication equipment, I think, is important because you won't necessarily always be able to travel together, especially if you have several people in your group. You might need to split up into teams and do things, right? I think you're going to want to have a good knife. I mean, that's definitely something you can use as a weapon, but a knife is also a tool. You know, you can carve steaks, you can make tinder, you can do some like bark shavings or something. Any type of camping gear is probably good. And I would say the last major thing I can think of in my survival kit would be some type of transportation, whether that's as simple as like some bicycles or uh, like a car or a, like an off-road vehicle or something that's going to allow you to get wherever you need to go. You know, probably nothing like, not like a huge gas guzzling beast, but you, you need something. Uh, and it's probably fair to say that you'll be able to scavenge gasoline for a while uh, in the aftermath, it is my guess, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, uh, I, think those are, I think those are really the essentials that I can think of. So everybody get your, uh, set up your wish lists. I love that. Mine is a lot simpler though. Okay. My list is really, really easy. Okay. I know who I am. I accept who I am. I apologize now for coming back and eating you when the zombie apocalypse <laughs> happens. <laughs> that's, so, that's my list. Okay. So your list is, I'm sorry, I'm a zombie. I'm probably going to eat you. <laughs> yeah. I, I know who I am. I'm going to be one of the first the fat zombie running around. I'm okay with that. Gotcha. But would you, if you have to go down though, would you prefer to go down like where you're running with a group and like you fall behind and your death actually ends up saving their lives? Or would you just rather go in your sleep and, you know, come what may? I don't like pain. I think I would Mm. want to go in the least painful way possible. That being said, I would like to think that I have the, the heroic bone in my body that would go, no, I'm going to, I'll fall back. You all protect yourself. I don't think I would be though. I, I'm I'm very discomforting with pain. So let me ask a question that might be difficult. Then. So if you were in a situation where like, say you even like twisted your knee really bad or something and you couldn't run anymore, right? And uh, you, you know, you were the slow one anyways, maybe like, cause that's kind of what you've been saying. Um, do you, in that moment, do you turn around and hold off the, you know, the, the line of zombies for as long as possible for your friends to get away? Or do you take the gun and... Uh, take the uh, least painful way out right away. Oh, see now, now you're that. That's a, it's not an easy question because you want to be noble, but at the same time, you don't want to be eaten alive. Yeah, I don't. I don't want the pain. I think that would be a very painful way to go. I think being eaten is is not the ideal solution. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. That's a that's a very good one. I like to think again. I like to think that I'm the the type that would self sacrifice and stay alive and fight them off as long as I could. I don't, I don't know though. I'm, I'm really, really, I think that's one of those questions you can only answer in the moment if it's actually happening. Yeah. Personally. Yeah. True enough. So that's my answer to that question <laughs> is I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't know. That's, that's tough. Cause you want to be the, the hero, but then again, I don't want to, I don't want to. I'll tell you what, I have a caveat. I have an exception. Okay. If the person that I'm potentially buying time for is my son, then yes, I'm going to go down fighting and holding them back for as long as possible. If it's just like, if it's just like dude from down the street who I saw walking his dog one time, I'm probably going to forego the whole being eaten alive in the most painful, uh, anguishing way possible. See, when you throw my wife and kids in there, yeah, there's no doubt about it. I, I'm fighting and I'm protecting them. So yeah, okay. Yeah, so I think that's an important consideration, actually. All right, well, I want to thank you, Will, again. And I want to give you the opportunity to tell everybody where they can get you, how they can reach you, where they can get your podcast and all that other fun stuff. Oh, thank you. So my podcast is called Mecha Dragon. We are a geek and nerd culture podcast. Uh, We cover a lot of movies and stuff on TV. Like we just did an Avengers Endgame uh, spoilers and non-spoilers discussion. Yes. Uh, So we just did that in like Game of Thrones. And, but we also were doing other nerdy stuff like, uh, you know, like, uh, tabletop role-playing games and we're gonna have all kinds of stuff you can find us on itunes spotify stitcher tune in anywhere you find your podcasts and our website which is uh, you can also listen to us there is mechadragon.net awesome thank you uh great conversation i appreciate it hopefully if you have any other fun interesting topics you want to bring up feel free to, to hit me up again i'd love to do it again oh yeah i will this has been really fun thanks for having me on All right. Well, thank you. And we'll talk again soon, guys. All right. Take care. Okay. So there it is. Is it philosophy? Go to our website at www.isitphilosophy.com and leave us a comment. 
We'd love to hear from you on Twitter and Facebook as well. Help us grow by going onto iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts and subscribe. And take a moment and leave a review. Until next time, question everything, seek your truth, and don't be afraid to speak your truth.